Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I offer one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where I invite you to sign up for my mailing list. If you go over to my website, there are two different lists you can sign up for. The one at the top of the page will sign you up for my regular mailing list, and you'll receive all of my class announcements and other missives. And then at the bottom of the page, you can also sign up for the daily inspiration email blast, and you'll receive an inspiring email from me every weekday. I also have a very active Facebook page, Illuminating Souls. So lots of ways we can connect beyond this podcast. But for now, The angels and I are gathered together to co-create a sweet and beautiful space where you can replenish, deepen in your connection with the divine love that is here for you. And also, if this is your bedtime, to drift off to sleep. This podcast is a blend of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and listening to a sleep podcast. I listen to different sleep podcasts every night to help me drift off. I happen to be someone who loves bedtime. I also love my waking life, so it's not just that bedtime is the highlight of my day. But there's something that is just so nurturing for me about feeling the fatigue starting to flow into my body at the divine right time. I get very annoyed when I'm fatigued in the middle of the day when I have things to do. But at the end of the day, I love that feeling. And I crawl up into bed. My husband usually stays up a little bit later than I do. And I cozy under the covers and I sleep with a lot of pillows, including a phenomenal body pillow from the company store in Wisconsin. I've been using one of their body pillows for many years. I highly recommend them. And I put in my earbuds and I select something to listen to. And I use a sleep timer so that it typically will turn off within about 45 minutes. And then by the time those 45 minutes are up, more often than not, I am asleep. And so that's why I chose to create a sleep podcast of all things. You know, there's so many different things I could do a podcast about, but I knew that I didn't want to do a podcast where I had to teach you really important things, you know, like I had to have a topic and a well thought out theme. I wanted to come here and wander and meander and ramble and just make space where we could keep each other company. And so a sleep podcast is just a genius way to do that because the bar is really low. I don't have to create really compelling content. I just have to show up and love. (laughs) Those are easy for me. And just ramble into this microphone for an hour, tell you stories and read to you and 
bring in the angels, and it's a sweet tapestry of love from my heart to yours. And I do acknowledge that many of you have shared with me that you listen during your waking hours, and it is truly a blessing to keep you company as well. I mean, you have lots of content you can listen to during the day while you're awake, and that you choose into this podcast, I am honored. So if you're new to the broadcast, here's what you can expect. We're going to be together for about an hour because that's my preference as a listener of sleep podcasts. I I get nervous if an episode is less than an hour because then what happens if I'm not asleep yet? So I usually can fall asleep within an hour. If you have more trouble than that, then you can create a playlist And I have intentionally designed this podcast so that one episode can pretty seamlessly flow into the next. So I don't have loud music. There's this this same rhythm and timber to every episode from the beginning to the end. There's a little bit of very soft music as the intro, but... It should not be disruptive to falling asleep. So if you set up a playlist of a few episodes, you should be able to have a pretty seamless experience of listening throughout the night. So lots of ways you can use this broadcast. And and here's a request for you, that if you are enjoying this and finding value in it, if you would consider leaving a review on iTunes on Apple's podcast app or Spotify or sharing it on social media. We are building through word of mouth. And that is because I am just, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of marketing. (laughs) I prefer divine marketing where people say, I have no idea how I found you. I'm like, that's awesome. Versus having to see an ad that I have spent money on and that annoys you when you do not want to see my ad. I much prefer organic marketing. So you can be one of my earth angels if you choose. (laughs) And we can create light and love together. So as I record this, it is early morning. That is my preferred time of day to record. I still kind of feel a little sleepy in a wonderful way. There is a quiet to this time of day that mirrors to me the time that is supportive of sleep. So I like to record in the early morning because it helps me stay in this energy field with you and for you. When I try to record in the middle of the day, it's harder to get into this zone for me and then the world is a bit louder, so... You can hear a little bit of traffic. We are about a mile away from the freeway and depending on the weather or the atmosphere, sometimes the freeway noise is louder than other times. So if you hear it, just a little extra ambient noise for your listening pleasure. And so the angels and I are weaving together a tapestry of love for you. So I invite you to get comfortable in your body if you aren't already or whatever level of comfort is available to you. Take a nice deep breath in and out. And I invite you to join me in gently calling ourselves forward into the heart of God. Experience the heart of God as presence. This beautiful, all-encompassing presence that is available to us all. It is never a presence we have to earn. It's like sitting outside and the sun is shining upon you at the perfect quality of sun for that moment. It's not too strong. It's not too elusive. It's just right. It's Goldilocks sun. It's just right. 
And that is my experience of divine love. It's powerful, it is present, and it's always just right. It's just what we need in the moment. It's perfect, it knows what we need, and it meets us here. And so, the angels are already here, but I love sharing the ritual of calling them forward with you. So let's take another deep breath in, releasing. Beautiful angels on high, I am so profoundly grateful for the opportunity to gather together with you in service to each of our beloveds listening to this broadcast. I ask that you infuse this vibrational transmission with love and healing, light and inspiration. And I invite you to bring to us wonderful, light-hearted, spirit-led opportunities, sparks of inspiration to help us move into the new, move into the vibrancy. Help us to awaken to that which will bring us immense delight and goodness. And I ask that you gather up our worries and fears and that which feels overwhelming and like too much and help to clear this from our energy field. Help us to acclimate and calibrate so that it is easier for us to be in the light that is always here for us. And so... I don't know if you are catching the vibe of what it is I'm bringing into our circle. It is something I am craving, and perhaps you are too. So, some new sparks of inspiration are speaking to me, and maybe they are for you as well. And I'm wired in an interesting way. I'm always fascinated by how I process consciousness. So these new ideas come to me and I'm so excited about them and then it requires something new of me, that I learn a new skill, that I try something different, that I expand in a way that might feel uncomfortable and I start getting overwhelmed and it's a really interesting experience of shadow and light. It's like the best and the brightest part of me and my worrying earth girl. They have, they have a coffee date. And the part of me that is very enthusiastic is like, and then we'll, we'll do this and we'll go that and this other thing will happen. It's going to be amazing. And then my worrisome earth girl goes, oh Yeah. (laughs) what if this happens? And what about the other thing? And you know, you're not very good at this part. And I think this life mastery is about how to hold the duality of both. You know, there's so much talk about non-duality, which is an incredibly powerful concept and way of approaching life. And I have found I need to make space for the duality that dwells within me. The part of me that is so excited and enthusiastic. And then the part of me that is profoundly practical. And it kind of reminds me of my dad. My dad was an awesome guy. Really, he was and is still in spirit for sure. And he was profoundly practical. He was someone who was born into the depression and went through a lot of life and fought in World War II. And and so stoicism and being very pragmatic helped him in life profoundly. So I have the dreamer's heart and the pragmatic part of me And it's hard 
I will say that it is hard sometimes. I, I've really kind of gone through the, the whole cycle over the weekend. There's a new endeavor I'm contemplating. So the dreamer in me is very excited. And the pragmatic part of me and the worrier in me is listing all the things that could go wrong. Like, is it worth it? What if this happens? What if the other thing happens? You know, I don't even know about this particular area of business. And and so I kind of called in my support team on the physical world reality and spoke with um, some of my beloved relatives. I am so blessed to have very wise people in my family and leaned into them a little bit. And I'm still not quite sure what I'm going to do. And the other thing I would reflect to you is it's okay not to know. The place of not knowing is living the question, which is part of a Rilke quote, a beautiful quote by the poet Rilke. So when I am in the place of I don't know, the part of me that loves knowing is very frustrated. But it is also a profoundly potent time when threads of creation are weaving together and a a play is being written, if you will. So all of this that is whirling around inside of me, the research I'm doing, the visioning, the what if I did this, what if I tried that, how would this work? the parts I'm worried about, the parts that I don't want to have to handle. It's like they all weave together because they're all part of the same journey. And so being in this place of not knowing, but knowing, being in this place of feeling enthusiastic and excited and also overwhelmed and afraid, all of it, something's, something's happening, right? Something is in motion and I don't know where it will end up. I don't know where I'll end up in this. Meaning will I decide just to put it on the shelf because we have permission to do that. There are endeavors that we contemplate and perhaps move forward with a little bit. And then we say, "Eh, maybe not goes on the shelf with other unfinished projects or maybe it becomes something even better than I can imagine or leads me down another rabbit hole so I want you to know you have permission to be in the messiness of creation in the middle of I don't know where and see where it takes you to honor the process of creation because What I can share is I have been very happy over the past few days. This this contemplation, this research, this the audacity of a new dream coming into me has really brought me so much joy. And it's brought joy to the people I've been talking to about it with as well. And those molecules of joy, they are precious. They're precious. They expand my presence, my energy field. And I don't know what happens to them. I don't know what happens. That's life, right? We live in the mystery. And we get more information and then we make choices. So I share all of this with you because I think sometimes from the outside looking in, it might look like I got this down, right? I decided to do an oracle card deck. I have an oracle card deck available. I decided to do the podcast. The podcast exists. But it's a really messy process to get to those places. There's a lot of things to navigate from here to there. So I'm in the early stages of navigation on another potential outlet and 
I'm in the worried stage. God bless my heart. I spend a lot of time in the worried stage. Do, do you guys, um, do you guys remember the cartoon Gulliver's Travels? There was a Lilliputian in the cartoon who was the worrier. And no matter what somebody said, he would at some point in the episode go, Oh no, we're doomed. <laughs> That's what that voice sounds like in me. Oh no, we're doomed. Oh no, what happens if, you know, this really awful thing could happen? And then what would you do? I'm like, oh my God, I don't know. And so it's a very interesting process. And I just hope my reflecting upon it helps you with your messy process, because I promise you, we are messy, messy beings <laughs> when it comes to co-creation. It's a continual journey of negotiating with our beliefs, with our emotions, with our capabilities, with physical world reality. It is a messy process but it is also one that expands our life force and brings us new experiences and new opportunities. And I don't know, I find it very fulfilling. So when something like this shows up for me, I, I dive in. So we're not even in story time yet, you guys. So we're still in the part of the podcast where we are inviting you, you to tuck yourself into bed and cozy on up and snuggle on in. And just allow yourself to drift off whenever you are ready and the angels will watch over you. And while you do, now we'll move into story time because I have a good story time for us. So, so for this story time, I'm laughing at myself because I was recently listening to the episode I recorded about ice cream. I love talking about food. I'm sure it's not a healthy thing for me. I just, I love food. Food is a love language for me. And I thought, I really, I would like more episodes like this. I loved listening to it and it made me very happy. And perhaps it made you happy too. And I thought, I wonder if I could do a whole episode about frozen yogurt, ice cream's cousin, because I love frozen yogurt. So that's what we're going to do now. I am going to spend the next 40 minutes waxing poetic about the deliciousness that is frozen yogurt. And I don't know why that just delights me. So first we have to talk about frozen yogurt. Like, what is it? I know you know what it is, but, but the genesis of it, how did it become a thing and why were so many people like me seduced by frozen yogurt? Okay. And, and I am so excited about this. I actually have some notes and some Wikipedias to read to you. So. The, the, the main chain that introduced us to this concept of frozen yogurt was TCBY, which became known as the country's best yogurt. And they were launched in 1981. So allow me to read to you just a little bit from its Wikipedia page. So in 1981, Frank D. Hickingbotham, I don't know if I've said that right, opened the first TCBY in Little Rock, Arkansas. TCBY began franchising the following year, and by 1984, there were over 100 stores. Prior to 1984, the company's name was This Can't Be Yogurt, but a lawsuit from a competitor, I Can't Believe It's Yogurt, forced TCBY to create a new name from its initials, eventually using the country's best yogurt. So, and then it franchised and in 2000, it was acquired by Mrs. Fields. And so, 
so they were off to the races. Now, I don't have a personal relationship with TCBY. I'm sure I've eaten it, but I want to share with you my personal assessment of why frozen yogurt became such a thing back in the 80s. So it's the early 80s. So the 70s and early 80s and and decades before that as well, just like today, a big diet culture, healthy, quote, quote, air quotes, healthy food. And we had been taught that yogurt was good for us. So yogurt, especially in the late seventies became this thing, you know, now everybody eats yogurt. There's a huge variety of yogurt available to us in the marketplace. But back in the seventies, yogurt was not as mainstream as it is now. And we were taught it was good for us. I even remember the little homemade yogurt makers. My mom had one and it, you put in the cultures and some milk and it would ferment the yogurt for you. This would be in the seventies at some point. And I remember thinking it tastes terrible, but we knew it was good for us because we were marketed to, right? They were like granola was good for us. Have you seen the calorie count on granola? I grew up thinking granola was healthy. It was good for me. So, you know, granola, yogurt, all of those things were good for us. And and again, so back in the 80s, we did not have the calorie count labels on food that we have now, the fat content. We didn't know and we didn't care. We were good. You told us it was healthy. It was a low cal, dietetic, low fat food. And as long as we eat low fat stuff, we're good to go. Even though to make things low fat or fat free, they would load them up on sugar. So this thing called frozen yogurt comes out. So in terms of the bill of goods we had been sold, frozen yogurt was better for you than ice cream because everyone knows that ice cream is fattening right? Like you can't just go and eat all the ice cream you want, but yogurt is good for you. And so it also comes out of like those custard machines, right? Like those swirly cone machines, which everyone loves. Who does not love a soft serve swirled cone or bowl of something? It is so delightful. And then with frozen yogurt, you could get two flavors or a swirled flavor and you could have toppings. It was a convergence of genius that deeply spoke to my heart and the hearts of millions of other people. So frozen yogurt enters the scene and a new food darling is born. So I don't know that I was obsessed with frozen yogurt until I moved to Los Angeles. So now we're going to leave the world of TCBY and I'm going to introduce you to an amazing frozen yogurt store in Los Angeles called the big chill. Big is spelled with two G's, B-I-G-G, chill. It's at the corner of Westwood and Olympic. So I'm going to read to you from their page. I don't think they will mind that I read to you from their homepage. Serving the best frozen yogurt in LA for 36 years, which means they were founded somewhere around 87 or 88. And I moved to Los Angeles in 85. So I know I was an early adopter of the Big Chill. It says, since we opened our shop 36 years ago, our delicious frozen treats continue to spark lines of devoted fans and yogurt connoisseurs. 
As a renowned staple of Los Angeles, we are passionate about our craft and dedicated to charm. We created over 400 distinctive flavors using live cultures and natural ingredients. So, Big Chill became a thing. And of course I had to go. First of all, I wanted to be a hip LA person for sure. That's why I moved there. And frozen yogurt. Of course, it was going to be my healthy treat. It's healthy. Frozen yogurt's healthy. Now, their yogurt is amazing. Well, I don't know. I haven't had it in, you know, 20 years. But when I was eating it, it was absolutely the most delicious frozen yogurt in the city. Like, it was the best. There's There were a lot of frozen yogurt stores that popped up, but none of them could hold a candle to the Big Chill. I don't know what the Big Chill did for their frozen yogurt. It's amazing. The challenge of being a Big Chill fan was parking. Now, if you've spent any time in Los Angeles, you will know the quality of the experience that you could have at a destination can be vastly influenced by the availability of parking. <laughs> and the Big Chill is not blessed in the parking department. It is at the corner of Westwood and Olympic, a very, very busy intersection. There is no parking, street parking, on those streets at 4 p.m., I think, because of rush hour. And the big chill parking lot, I actually went onto Google Maps and looked, maybe has 12 to 15 parking spaces. And they share, they're in a strip mall. They share the strip mall with, these days, it looks like it's a bagel shop, a dry cleaners, a jeweler's, and another store that I didn't recognize. So to try and get a parking space at the Big Chill was an act of chutzpah and patience because there was never parking in that parking lot. And it's not like you could park down the street and walk up because the side streets are all permit parking. And on Olympic and Westwood after... 4 p.m., you couldn't park there because of rush hour. So the first thing was to get a parking space, and I would circle the block. Listen, I'm a Taurus. I am stubborn. And so I would have this tenacity because frozen yogurt was involved, and I would circle the block. I would be one of those very annoying people that would just sit and wait I was young. I did not know about being a good citizen of the world. I would just wait. I was just going to wait for me because I must have my frozen yogurt. And then ultimately, God willing, I would get a parking space. So you get the parking space and now you have to wait in line. This is why there's no parking because Big Chill would be so crowded. There would be a long line. Now, one of the amazing things about frozen yogurt places and, and okay, ice cream places do it too, but I thought it was super special coming from frozen yogurt places is you could sample flavors and they would do a little pull of the flavor into this little paper cup. And so I think part of the reason the line didn't move very fast is people would get to the front of the line and they'd be like, can I taste the peanut butter? And the person would have to go and do a pull of the peanut butter and then the person would taste it. And like they were sipping fine wine, like this is a a wine tasting in Napa where you swirl it in your mouth and you contemplate the flavor. And then they would say, could I taste the chocolate? And this would go on for a few minutes. You You figure a few minutes for each customer to taste and contemplate their yogurt choice. (laughs) 
it, it would not be a fast process. So you'd wait. And, and you'd wait because you knew when it was your turn, you got to have your samples. And so I would always ask for a taste of something, even if I knew I wasn't going to get it. Because when I went to the Big Chill, my choice was their peanut butter frozen yogurt. Maybe I would add chocolate to it. Now, here's the thing about their peanut butter frozen yogurt at the time. I don't know what it's like now. It was low fat versus non-fat. All the other flavors were non-fat. Peanut butter was low fat, but peanut butter was the superior flavor of the Big Chill. So I would be like, throw caution to the wind. I'm going for a low fat frozen yogurt flavor. Delicious. And then I would get a topping and my topping of choice was granola. Granola is good for you, right? Now, I knew enough to know that granola was kind of fattening, but it was granola. But their granola had little carob chips, and it it was a candy granola, basically, where I would never have gotten M&Ms on my yogurt because that was too rich and decadent. But load me up with the granola, please, with the little carob chips. (laughs) So I would get my peanut butter, frozen yogurt, low-fat, with the granola. And sometimes I would get a couple of servings so that I could then go put it in my freezer at home. And frozen yogurt bought at a yogurt store and then put in the freezer, it crystallizes so it's not as good, but it's still a delicious option. So Big Chill and I were good friends, although I hated their parking situation. I can't tell you how often I would drive home from work because for a while I worked on the west side and I would have to drive past the big chill to go home and I would longingly look into their parking lot to see if there was even a chance I could get a spot so I could get some frozen yogurt on the way home. So the 80s was this glorious time for yogurt. And the thing was, is many of us thought this was a healthy option. There's a phenomenal Seinfeld episode where a frozen yogurt store opens near them and Elaine just starts eating this yogurt. She's like, it's yogurt. It's good for you. And starts gaining weight and no one can figure out why. She's like, how can it be the yogurt? It's yogurt. So... We all had that experience. Uh, Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that you had that experience. I certainly did. I mean, listen, I don't know that I gained weight because of yogurt, but yogurt to me was not this calorie-laden indulgence. It was, it's healthy. Oh, I'm going to go have some frozen yogurt. Again, there weren't tons of calorie counts and all of that stuff all over the place. We we didn't want to know. Listen, I think it's great that food packaging is what it is today, but there are times in my life I don't want to know. Don't tell me. I'm just going to eat what I want to eat. I don't want to know. So for many years, that was my relationship, was Big Chill. There was also a really good yogurt place in West Hollywood that also had parking problems, but it was closer to me when I lived in West Hollywood. And at some point, Well, I don't know. I never really cut back on the frozen yogurt until I completely gave up sugar in 2019. So let me tell you about some of the other frozen yogurts that have left an impact in my life. So during the big chill era, you would go into a frozen yogurt store and there would be, I don't know, six to eight different flavors. And the flavors would change every day. I mean, it was like going to the the show. It's like, I don't know what is there today. It's not the exact same stuff it was yesterday. What new flavors do they have? And then you would get to try the flavors. So, so this was a delight and most of the flavors were sweet, right? Maybe there would be a berry flavor, but it would be chocolate and English toffee and pistachio and peanut butter and all these very sweet, delicious flavors. And then in 2005, P. 
Pinkberry comes on the scene. Pinkberry introduced the U.S. market to the tart frozen yogurt that was all the rage in South Korea and maybe Japan. So I'm going to read to you from their Wikipedia. It says Pinkberry is a franchise of frozen dessert restaurants headquartered in Scottsdale, Arizona. The first store was opened in January of 2005. So the owner of that Pinkberry is, let's see, hold on just a second. The first store in January 2005 by Shelly Huang and Young Lee, they wanted to open a formal English tea house on a tiny residential street called Huntley Drive in West Hollywood, California. Huntley Drive is actually a very short street and is darling and impossible parking. Like Again, with the impossible parking. However, after the city refused to approve an alcohol permit for Huang and her business partner, they decided to go with their second plan, which was a frozen yogurt concept, reviving the craze of the 80s. People were soon driving across town and standing in line for 20 to 30 minutes to get their fix of the taste that launched a thousand parking tickets. (laughs) So, parking Notoriously hard on Huntley Drive. I think maybe I would have gone there a handful of times, even though I lived nearby, but I never went to that Pinkberry. I didn't care how good their yogurt was. I was not going to try and find a parking space on Huntley Drive. It was too hard. So my first experience of Pinkberry would be in Santa Monica with my girlfriend, Julia. And it was on Montana, which is a very hip and trendy street in Santa Monica. And she says, Oh my God, you haven't had Pinkberry. You have to try it. You love dessert. And Pinkberry's thing was they just had one flavor. It was the tart Pinkberry frozen yogurt. And they had unusual toppings. They had cereal. So like Fruit Loops would go on the Pinkberry. And they also had mochi, which back In the early 2000s, mainstream America had not been introduced to mochi yet. Well, what delightful little pillows of deliciousness mochi is. So I remember she had me get, you know, a cup of the pink berry and she said, put Fruit Loops and mochi on it. Well, the Fruit Loops I didn't care about. I've sugared cereals never been my food. Like, if you asked me to give up something with sugar, I would have no problem never eating sugared cereal back in my dessert days. Why would I pick sugared cereal when I could have a cookie? But mochi balls, now that was a revelation to my mouth. That was delicious. So, so here's the thing about Pink Perry. It, it got in under my sugar radar, like, well, it's healthy. It's real yogurt. It tastes like yogurt because it's tart. So it can't possibly be as unhealthy as my big chill yogurt was. What did I know? I didn't care. But I was hooked. Like, here's another treat of deliciousness. So this whole delightful tart yogurt phase of my life started. So somewhere around 2007, 2008, I move up to Vallejo. Wes and I buy a house and the yogurt options were dismal. We did not have the yogurt opportunities that we had in Los Angeles because Los Angeles was a mecca for delicious frozen yogurt. There was even one up the block from my house, my apartment in Los Angeles, two blocks up. Where I lived in Los Angeles, I could walk up two blocks, two long blocks, but two blocks, up to Olympic Boulevard. And I could go get the best sushi from Crazy Fish. 
Again, parking was impossible, so I would walk. But nobody walks in Los Angeles. At least we didn't back then, so I'd be like, oh my God, I've got to walk up there to get my food. I know New Yorkers, you think that's crazy, but it was L.A. So I got my crazy fish, and then I could walk across the street and get frozen yogurt, and they had the tart frozen yogurt, and they had the mochi balls. So I'd get this feast, this delicious feast. I would have my sushi, and I would have my frozen yogurt with mochi balls, and I would go home. That was the best. The best. It was like a trifecta of awesomeness. I'm home with sushi and frozen yogurt with mochi balls. Delightful. So back to the move to Northern California, Vallejo, abysmal frozen yogurt options. And then I discovered there was a tart frozen yogurt store up in Pleasant Hill which will probably mean nothing to you, but basically it's a drive across the bridge. Not a big deal, except you have to pay a toll every time you go over the bridge. And back then I think it was $4. Now it's seven, soon to be eight, but it was four then. And so a toll is involved. That's crazy. But this place had great frozen yogurt and great flavors. They were all tart. So you could get the plain tart or the blueberry tart or the mango tart, again with mochi. And so I would bring a little cooler and I would order like 10 cups for Wes and I. Because I was not going to keep driving over that freaking bridge and paying that toll. (laughs) So I would get it all packed up. And he always knew when I was coming. And he, he, of course, I was a phenomenal customer. And it would sit in our freezer and we would have frozen yogurt whenever we wanted it. It was delightful. And then the other thing I have to share about what I loved about frozen yogurt was especially when the self-serve frozen yogurt thing became available. So, So there's two different kinds of frozen yogurt stores. One is where the person behind the counter dispenses your frozen yogurt and puts your toppings on your yogurt. Okay, I get that that is a business model, but I would always feel like they're being too stingy. Come on, give me another scoop of granola kind of thing. But then there were the self-serve frozen yogurt places where you just paid by the ounce. Now, now this is my kind of place because I have full control over what is going in my cup. So Yogurt Land, maybe somewhere around 2010, opens in Pinnell, which is again over the bridge. One was the Carquinas Bridge, the other is the Benicia Bridge. But Yogurt Land was self-serve. Heaven. Heaven on earth. First of all, you could pull your own sample cups. Thank you very much. And then you could make your own blend of whatever you wanted and put in your own toppings. So I loved Yogurt Land. I had a one of those frequent buyer club card things. <laughs> so I'd get free yogurt at some point. And I loved Yogurt Land. They still exist. So so frozen yogurt. I don't know, somehow we bought into this idea that it was a healthier version of ice cream, but it is really just its own dessert category. And and if I get to put on whatever toppings I want, there is nothing diet worthy. Like, I, it's not like I put a few strawberries on. I'm like, give me the crushed butterfingers and the mochi and I'm going to put some Heath Bar. <laughs> like it was, it was like worthy of a giant piece of cake. But it was delicious. And then in 2019, August of 2019, I got very serious about having bariatric surgery and I went off of sugar. So no more frozen yogurt for me. 
every once in a while, that voice in my head that tries to negotiate the slippery slope says, well, you know that they have sugar-free frozen yogurt, don't you? Because most stores will have sugar-free frozen yogurt. And I have to say to that voice, oh no, 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 because there's a slippery slope involved. If I start having sugar-free frozen yogurt, it's all empty calories. Like there's no nutritional value in this. I mean, it has calorie values, but it's just a bad idea all the way around. So if any part of you was going to say, but Laurel, there's sugar-free frozen yogurt, it can't exist for me. I can't ever have it. I can't ever try it. It cannot be an option in my life because I have this really weird brain. It's interesting. Dr. David Kessler wrote a book called The End of Overeating. And one of the things he talks about is the brain can turn things on and off. Like if there's a food that you can't have, maybe you're allergic to it or something, the brain will turn the switch off on that desire. And so over, let's see, I've been, had bariatric surgery, I guess I'm now in my fourth year. So I've had three full years. I'm in my fourth year. And certain foods on the slippery slope have come back into my life. And once they're in, it's very hard to get them out again. And, and I'm managing it okay, but I'm just very aware of this process. I cannot walk into a frozen yogurt store and pull a little sample cup of a sugar-free frozen yogurt. Because then I can have all the sugar-free frozen yogurt I want. If I have a little bit, I can have all of it. Because that's how my brain works. Isn't that fascinating? Our brains are wild. So, no frozen yogurt for me, but I do have a Ninja Creamy. I did a whole episode on my Ninja Creamy. So I can make my own variation of frozen yogurt where I have full control over what's in it. And it does not trigger that part of my slippery slope. You know, it's interesting. The Ninja Creamy has brought a lot of freedom, although I haven't used it in about a year. But I can create one with protein drinks. I can I can do whatever I want with it, and I know what's in it. It also takes a little bit of work, so the magic of a frozen yogurt store isn't involved. But it does allow me to kind of have a creamy, desserty experience when I want it. So there you go. A whole episode Devoted to frozen yogurt, TCBY, to the Big Chill, <laughs> to Pinkberry, to that cool place up in Pleasant Hill, to the one in Pinall, Yogurt Land, and my Ninja Creamy, the evolution of my journey with frozen yogurt, brought to you by Laurel Bleedin' Maffei. <laughs> so, perhaps you're asleep by now. Or perhaps you have the craving for a frozen, dessertified treat of some kind. Whatever it is, I send you love. And thank you for allowing me the blessing of keeping you company. I love you very much, and I wish you the sweetest of dreams. Thank you. <laughs>